Hello, thank you for joining us today to discuss Kasia Therapeutics. I'm Sue Romanoff, Head of Healthcare Content here at Edison Group. Uh, uh, we look forward to discussing the new data shared at ISPNO earlier this month and how our speakers are working to combat childhood brain cancer. Following this presentation, we'll host a Q&A session. If you'd like to submit a question at any point, please do so by using the Q&A box at the bo bottom of your Zoom application. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly pause here so we can review this forward-looking statement slide. I'd also like to note that today's presentation is being recorded. Joining us today from Kasia, we have Dr. James Garner, Chief Executive Officer, and Dr. John Friend, Chief Medical Officer. James and John will be joined by Associate Professor Matt Dunn of Hunter Medical Research Institute. With that being said, I'll hand it over to you, James. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to this educational webinar. We're grateful today to have the opportunity to talk about a topic which has emerged as, as one of increasing significance for Casio in a strategic sense, and which also, I think, resonates in a very deep and personal way for all of us who work in the company. And that topic is childhood brain cancer. And as you've heard, we're very grateful to be joined today by Associate Professor Matt Dunn at the Hunter Medical Research Institute at the University of Newcastle in Australia, who is going to talk us through that new data that was recently presented at uh, the ISPNO conference, the International Symposium of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology. And myself and Dr. John Friend, our Chief Medical Officer, will add some commentary on what this really means for Casia, how we think about this disease area in the company, and about some of the other activities that are going on in childhood brain cancer within Casia. So let me begin by just perhaps making a few contextual remarks here, first of all. And I'd like to begin by just providing an orientation for those who are new to the company or new to the Paxalicid program. Paxalicid is a drug that is being developed for brain cancer, and primarily for adult brain cancer. Our lead indication, as you can see here, is glioblastoma, the most common and the most aggressive primary brain tumor in adults. And the drug is in a phase three study in, uh, in glioblastoma. We expect to see final data from that study next year. So, uh, so the program is well advanced and rapidly approaching potential commercialization in adult brain cancer. Behind that, however, we have a substantial and growing body of work, both in clinical trials and in preclinical research in childhood brain cancers, particularly in two forms that you see shown here, DIPG, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, and ATRT, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors. And both of these have been the subject of recent data readouts, which we'll review today. Behind that, we have other work going on in adult brain cancers, primary CNS lymphoma, and in brain metastases. And we expect to have more information to share on those in the coming months. And I just say that uh, brain cancer is the most common malignancy of childhood. It is a disease that perhaps is uh, often thought about less than diseases like leukemia, which is, uh, which is often uh, sort of the, perhaps the, the malignancy that we think of as most common in the pediatric setting. But brain cancer is more common. Uh, and not only is it more common, but it is sad to say ex extremely more lethal than uh, hematological malignancies such as leukemia and lymphoma. Um, the, uh, the, the number of children passing from brain cancer exceeds that passing from lymphoma by almost twofold. And indeed, many of the fatalities these days in leukemia are due to brain metastases, which as in adult tumors become very difficult to treat. So this is sad to say in the context of pediatric oncology, not a rare disease. This is, uh, this is unfortunately one of, the, one of the main challenges facing pediatric oncologists. And when we look at our progress in, the, in this disease area, it has, sad to say, been exceptionally poor. This chart shows in the red bars, the, uh, the survival rates associated with some common childhood tumors First in 1960 in the red bars, and then in 2000 in the blue bars. And as you can see for uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, myeloid leukemia, and Hodgkin's lymphoma, all of which are blood cancers, hematological malignancies, we have seen 
massive improvements in survival associated with better treatment of these diseases. Wilms tumor, a, a rare tumor of the kidneys that primarily affects children up to the age of about five, a similar improvement in survival. But in brainstem gliomas, um, perhaps one of the more common malignant tumors of, uh, of the brain in children, really no progress at all. And that has been partly a function of no new therapies in this disease. As you can see on the panel on the right hand side of the slide, we have no FDA approved drugs to treat any of these common childhood brain cancers. And so, uh, so this, as we, as we sometimes say in Casio, this is very much the definition of unmet medical need. We have uh, a disease that represents the, the most common cause of childhood cancer death, but for which we have no drug treatments. And when we talk about childhood brain cancer, it's important to note that we are talking about an extremely diverse spectrum of illness. About 5,000 incident cases a year in the United States, and a little over half of those are malignant in nature. The number of non-malignant tumors, meningiomas, choroplexus tumors, and so on, which, uh, which we won't talk about today. But within the malignant category, gliomas are the most common as a disease of the uh, the glial cells in the brain, uh, which is the same cell that gives rise to, uh, to diseases like glioblastoma. Uh, and within that group, a subset is, uh, is a, a group of cancers called diffuse midline gliomas, tumors essentially of the spinal cord, brainstem, and thalamus. And uh, just a word on terminology here, uh, we talk a lot about DIPG, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, a particular form of glioma yeah, that occurs in children. Um, DMGs, diffuse midline gliomas, is a more uh, modern terminology and a slightly uh, broader term than DIPG. For practical purposes, the two are somewhat interchangeable these days, but you'll hear us talk about both DMGs and DIPGs, and they, uh, in, in the way that we use them, they tend to mean roughly the same thing. There's also a category of embryonal tumors here, which comprises, uh, again, a range of different cancers. ATRT is one that we'll speak about today. And I'll just note in passing medulloblastoma, another form of embryonal childhood brain cancer, which uh, has been an area of interest for the company where we've, we've had some stimulating discussions in recent months and something we, we may come to look at more closely in, in, uh, in the months ahead. And I'd just say that this has historically been perhaps uh, a neglected area for the pharmaceutical industry. Childhood cancer in general has not seen uh, a lot of new approvals up until about five years ago. And this chart shows uh, FDA approvals of new therapies for childhood cancers over the last decade. And as you can see, the first half of the decade fairly sparse, but over the last five or seven years, a real burst of activity with uh, more than a dozen new therapies being approved for childhood cancers. Sad to say none of these for childhood brain cancer at this stage, but certainly I think this reflects a growing focus of industry, a growing prioritization of pediatric malignancies. Why is this happening? Well, one reason is that the regulatory environment has really moved in favor of companies trying to develop drugs for these kinds of diseases. This slide characterizes some of the key legislation, both the United States and Europe, that uh, pertains to the development of diseases for, uh, of drugs for pediatric indications. And I would characterize it by saying that the public policy has really moved from carrot to stick over the last couple of decades. If we look at back at BPCA, one of the initial pieces of legislation way back in 2002, this really provided some, some fairly gentle incentives for sponsors to, be, to develop drugs for, uh, for, for childhood diseases. But if we look at the more recent legislation, the Race for Children Act about five years ago, this really imposes obligations on pharmaceutical companies to, uh, to provide pediatric development plans. And so we've really seen a, a shift in, in, uh, in the regulatory framework from incentive to, uh, to obligation. And I think that's been one of the drivers behind, uh, behind the increasing interest of, of industry here. There are, however, still very substantial incentives. And one of those is noted at the bottom here, the Creating Hope Act of 2012, which created the uh, opportunity for pediatric priority review vouchers, the ability on submitting a drug for a pediatric indication to receive 
a, uh, a priority review voucher which can be sold to other companies and which have historically commanded significant value in the secondary market. And those who follow the Casio story will be aware we do have rare pediatric disease designation from FDA for DIPG. It is kind of the crucial designation that uh, opens this opportunity for us. So, um, so again, uh, as I say, a mixture of, uh, of commitment and incentive here in terms of the regulatory framework. And so with that very brief overview, I'd like to hand over now to Associate Professor Matt Dunn to talk through some of the data he recently presented at the ISPNO conference in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, Matt, uh, over to you. Thanks, James, and good morning and good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for me to present some of our data that's uh, been focused on working up uh, Paxalicid for the treatment of DIPG and DMG over the last four and a half years. Next slide, please, James. So you know, for those of the uninitiated, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma or diffuse midline glioma is a glioma diagnosed within the brainstem um, of the central nervous system. So the brainstem sits atop uh, of the spinal column and it's a really critical organ uh, that regulates life essential functions. And, and they in include the autonomic functions such as cardiac control and, sp and respiratory control, uh, but also um, numerous um, in critical neurons tra traverse the brainstem that allow uh, our body to move. So our motor neurons uh, run parallel to the brainstem. So a tumor that's diagnosed and grows rapidly within this organ has devastating consequences. Unfortunately uh, for kids, and as James beautifully articulated, there's no recognized therapies for DIPG other than radiotherapy and children succumb of their disease within nine to 11 months. So it really highlights the need to identify therapies that may uh, somewhat uh, circumvent this terrible survival um, statistic. Um, next slide, please, James. So DIPG is a uh, heterogeneous disease, which means that there's a lot of changes to the cell's DNA uh, that gives rise to the disease. But more importantly, I think DIPG is an epigenetic disease. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that um, the, the, the regulation of the genes that are, uh, that are responsible for the growth and survival of, of the tumour are completely unravelled and they are able to be um, created and drive the growth of the disease very rapidly. And what I mean by that is that they mostly um, uh, regulate the way that the cell produces energy. Now, there's a number of mutations within DIPG that are seen across all patients. And many of these gene mutations are linked to the targets of Pax salicib, and these include, include uh, the PIK3CA, PIK3R1, uh, and the P10 gene. Now, when you have mutations in these genes, it leads to unfettered control of this PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, and the cells are, are rapidly able to um, generate new energy from a various a range of sources, um, which may be uh, directly from glucose uptake, uh, insulin, and also fats. And that means that the cells are almost um, completely metabolically immortal. So um, it, Paxalicid makes a good, a good way to target some of these pathways because it hits the PR3 kinase pathway at the top of the tree. Next slide, please, James. Uh, so here, We've, um, we've been using uh, a number of drugs in combination with Onctua, with Paxalicib, and, and particularly I'd like to point out uh, this drug called Onctua-1. Now Onctua-1 was discovered um, in 2012 as, a, as a, a way to kill cancer cells that have loss of function of the, the most mutated gene in cancer, and that's TP53. This drug Onctua-1 um, is, is a very uh, small molecule that crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets into the brain. And it's a very safe drug with uh, very few adverse events being recorded on multiple clinical trials that it's tested uh, its maximum tolerated dose and trials that are now, now starting to investigate efficacy. Uh, we collected the data on, on 28 DIPG patients that had gained access to onc 201 over a two and a half or three year period and report uh, here in, in the panel on the left, uh, a median overall survival of approximately 18 months. So a, a seven to eight month improvement on historical controls. But as you can see in the middle, uh, te preclinical testing of the drug shows that DIPG cells, which are mostly harvested um, from uh, patients that were donated by their families at autopsy, uh, there's a various uh, and heterogeneous range of responses to the drug, meaning that you know, more than 50% of the cells that we've tested show absolutely no response to the drug. 
So we wanted to use that as a basis for investigating why the cells respond and why they failed. And when we did so, uh, we, we investigated numerous of uh, these cell lines that showed no response to the drug and that they all popped up to show they had hyperactivated PI3 kinase AKC signaling here on the right. And that was driving um, processes that, that led to um, immortality, such as turning off the cell's um, intrinsic ability to die, which is called apoptosis, um, turning the cells into more of a stem cell-like cell, which means that uh, they don't respond to, to radiotherapy or chemotherapy, uh, and then upregulating pathways that uh, synthesize glucose and, and insulin to, to drive their metabolic needs. Next slide, please, James. So uh, once we were armed with that information, we took um, very um, uh, uh, poorly sensitive um, DIPG cells that were taken from um, a patient at autopsy, and, and we implanted these into um, uh, research animals and tested both drugs as a monotherapy and, and also in combination. And here you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve on the left, that both drugs provide a, a modest uh, survival benefit compared to vehicle control. But when we combine PI, uh, the PI3 kinase AKT inhibitor Paxalicib with Onctuo1, we, we saw an, a significant increase in survival. Now, taking tumors out of, the, out of the mice that had been treated with the drug and investigating whether we had on-target effects, um, this is a really nice way to determine whether one, the drugs are getting into the brain, and two, whether the drugs are doing what they're meant to do. And as you can see on the left, these are called Western blots. So this is a protein array, but we've taken protein out of the primary tumor of, of, that was growing in the, in the mouse and investigated whether the, the targets of the drugs were indeed being downregulated as a consequence of treatment. And here you can see the two best markers of Paxalicib efficacy, uh, the AKT proteins on the top right, are completely abolished with treatment, uh, either used as a monotherapy or in combination with Onctuo1. And as you can see in the middle column, Onctuo1 indeed drives further activation of the PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, which really highlights why the combination works so well. Next slide, please, James. Now, phase 1b clinical trials for both drugs as monotherapies have shown very acceptable uh, toxicity profiles, and, and we've determined maximum tolerated dose thanks to these two early stage clinical trials. Uh, and as a consequence, the uh, lead clinicians in, in involved in these studies um, uh, were encouraged to test the combination, firstly, in a patient that, that was on the Onctur one clinical trial as a monotherapy here on the left. And this patient um, had a um, stable disease for about 12 months whilst receiving Onctur one alone, and that was uh, started immediately post radiotherapy. The patient um, experienced quite significant disease progression, which is marked here in C, uh, and then elected to have re irradiation. And whilst she had re irradiation, she continued on Onctur one, and the day after re irradiation was completed, commenced Paxalicib. And she experienced a dramatic uh, regression of the primary tumour, uh, so much so uh, that it, the tumour had re reduced back to stable disease settings. And the reduction in the, in the size of the tumour um, was not seen uh, after primary and diagnostic radiotherapy, identifying that we indeed uh, were seeing a therapeutic benefit from Paxalicib. The patient experienced um, almost complete uh, disease uh, clinical symptom regression and she returned to school. Um, but unfortunately, she passed of an unrelated pneumonia. Um, and, and at our autopsy, um, we, we were able to conclude that the tumour hadn't grown uh, and that the tumour looked quite necrotic. And when we performed um, sequencing on the, on the tumour at, at autopsy, we indeed identified that she had a PI3 kinase mutation. The second patient um, uh, continues on therapy. Um, she commenced um, Onctur1 and Paxalicib post-diagnostic uh, and, and um, re-radiation, re uh, where she had a, a good response to radiation, um, as you can see here in C. Uh, the disease stabilised in the seven weeks uh, prior to the start of the combination, um, and then she started the, the combination and she experienced continual disease regression uh, up, and it's now 17 months past diagnosis and the, and the patient continues to do really well. This patient also harbours a PI3 kinase mutation and other hallmark uh, DIPG-specific mutations. Um, and the, with um, very few adverse events, um, some PI3 kinase related side effects, including mucositis, which is now quite well managed using dex dexamethasone mouthwash. Uh, I think that's it for me, James. I know we'll talk about the phase two clinical trial. So uh, these data uh, have underpinned uh, our, our work uh, in the phase two setting, and, and that's to combine Paxalicib and Onctuo1 at various disease settings. Um, so, firstly, uh, patients at diagnosis. Um, will receive Paxalicib or Onctuo1 as a monotherapy combined with 
diagnostic radiotherapy and then continue on a maintenance therapy a maintenance therapy of Oncto1 plus paxalicid. Um, because this trial is a patient-centered trial, we, we uh, really um, designed it so that patients can almost come at all stages. So patients are able to enroll up to 14 weeks post radiation at diagnosis or uh, at, at, at disease progression. And at disease progression, it's encouraged for re-irradiation to again be um, performed in combination with either of the drugs as a monotherapy and then as a consolidation or maintenance therapy, Paxalicib and Oncto1 are continued. We've got various disease markers uh, and, and it's a quite a detailed study in terms of um, mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to ensure that we're really getting across any potential adverse events, uh, toxicities and efficacies. And, and it's rolling out in 32 pediatric centres around the world, including um, uh, 26 in America and eight in Australia. Uh, the trial has been open now since October, uh, recruiting extremely well. And I think we now have over 30 patients that are enrolled on the, on the clinical trial. So things are going well. Next slide, please, James. Thanks. Matt, thank, thank you very much indeed. That's uh, a, a fantastic overview of a, an enormous body of, of work. And uh, I'm going to pass now to uh, Kazi's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. John Friend, just to talk about briefly ab about uh, a second uh, and more recent uh, area of activity, ATRT, and uh, some very interesting data that's been emerging there. So, John, over to you. Thanks, James. And we can just jump to the next slide. So atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors are very aggressive pediatric cancers that occur in the central nervous system or generally, and generally form in the cerebellum and or brainstem affecting boys and girls equally. Um, most children present with symptoms and are diagnosed between six months and three years of age. Problems with coordination, walking, facial tics, and a constitution of other non-specific symptoms usually prompt a more in-depth workup, including CT and MRI scans. So without going into too much detail, ATRTs are typically associated with an abnormality in a specific gene called SMARCB1 or SMARCB1. Uh, this helps prevent tumor growth in the body. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University have demonstrated that the activation of PA3K, AKT, mTOR pathway that you've heard Professor Dunn talk about is also commonly observed in ATRT. There are currently no standard or FDA approved treatments for children with ATRT. Multimodality treatment consisting of surgery, chemotherapy, and or radiation is under evaluation now. So even with this intensive multimodality treatment, the four-year event-free survival rate is 37%, and the four-year overall survival rate in ATRT is a dismal 43%. Kazi was approached by the Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Group at Johns Hopkins, who've been researching and treating rare pediatric brain cancers for decades. Um, Professor Jeffrey Rubin studies how unique interactions between proto-oncogenes, metabolomics, and epigenomics drive pediatric brain tumor growth and survival. Um, he looks for vulnerabilities in these regulatory pathways that can be inhibited to selectively target aggressive pediatric brain tumors and improve survival while reducing treatment-related morbidities. Dr. Rubens proposed a stepwise evaluation of paxalicib as monotherapy and in various combinations for the treatment of ATRT. After establishing monotherapy efficacy via in vitro, followed by in vivo models, various potentially synergistic combinations would be evaluated by in vitro and in vivo models in the same process. The ultimate goal really of any preclinical program is translating these findings into a clinical study to evaluate the true clinical relevance and significance. Some of the data that's been generated as a result of this collaboration was presented this year at two international scientific congresses, the 2022 AACR meeting in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and the 20th um, International Society of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology, or ISNO meeting in Hamburg, Germany. Um, thanks, James. So, so really, after demonstrating positive monotherapy response via in vitro models, Paxalicib was evaluated in two highly specific ATRT orthotopic xenograft mouse models. These are the CHLA06 and BT12. The two figures on the slide are overall survival curves. Um, comparing paxalicib to control or placebo. 
In both models, you can clearly see an early separation of survival curves with paxalacib treated mice outliving the control mice. With the first objective of the collaboration completed, the evaluation of various paxalacib combinations was really next on the list. Thanks, James. The Johns Hopkins labs had previously identified, again, the strong activation of the PI3K, AKT, mTOR, and MAPK, MAPK signaling pathway in ATRT. You know, these pathways are frequently activated in other aggressive cancers and really contribute to the rapid growth and survival in part by reprogramming cancer cell metabolism that you may have heard Dr. Dunn mention earlier. Day 101, also known as uh, tovarafenib, it's an investigational brain penetrant type two pan-RAF kinase inhibitor, sorry, a little bit of a mouthful, that targets a key enzyme in the MAPK signaling pathway. The company Day One announced earlier this month some positive data from an ongoing clinical study in pediatric low-grade glioma with nearly two thirds of the patients having a partial response to day 101. Therefore, Dr. Rubens proposed to further enhance the benefit already provided by Paxalicid by combining with day 101, the results of which are shown in the, these top two figures. So utilizing a highly specific in vitro cell model, CHLA05, the Hopkins researchers evaluated cancer cell viability at, after five days and 24-hour apoptosis or killing of the cancer cell in the vehicle represented by the black bar. Very low doses of paxalacid. So we're talking doses uh, right here, 600 nanomolar, which is equivalent to 0 0.6 micromolar in red. Day 101 is monotherapy in blue. And then the combination of the low dose paxalacid with day 101 in green. So as you can see, clearly in both assays, in both studies, paxalacib is superior to the vehicle and that the addition of day 101 further enhances that response and the statistical significance. Again, with the goal of identifying other synergistic combinations to paxalacib, histone deacetylase or HDAC inhibitors were considered due to a complementary activation of the FOXO, FOXO signaling pathways. As such, Dr. Rubin, hypothesized that RG2833, which is a brain penetrant HDAC specific or a 1,3 specific inhibitor, may be additive or potentially even synergistic to paxalacid. So again, using um, two other in vitro cell lines specific to ATRT, CDK1 and LIN28A, the two figures on the bottom of the slide again demonstrate that low doses of paxalacid at the 300 nanomolar range in combination with an HDAC inhibitor are complementary and result in cancer cell cycle disruption. So the team at Johns Hopkins is continuing to work further to validate as well as enhance what they've discovered to date. And then uh, next slide. Great, so then the next, uh, I, I have one more slide um, and then we can get into more of a question and answers, but this kind of gives an, an overview of, of CASIA and our program and just enhances a little bit more and provide a little bit more detail uh, on top of what James had mentioned. So today we've heard Professor Dunn eloquently present just a small portion of the work he and his lab have published to date on diffuse midline glioma and DAPG. And I would personally like to thank Dr. Dunn for truly moving the needle in terms of the science of pediatric brain cancers, as well as just an overall increase in, in awareness and the need for novel therapeutics in this space. Um, the preliminary findings in DIPG patients from the Paxalacid Phase one study at St. Jude's Hospital were presented a couple of years ago, and the overall study is nearing completion now. Um, the data from this study was Real, truly the foundation for the inclusion of Paxalacid in the PNOC22 study that you heard Professor Dunn mention, um, and is currently in the U.S. and actively recruiting and doing quite well um, since it was initiated uh, in November of 2021. From a regulatory perspective, you heard that FDA has granted Paxalacid both orphan drug designation and rare pediatric disease designation approximately a year and a half ago. Um, ODD and RPDD are extremely important designations from a corporate perspective, obviously because of providing you know, additional market exclusivity, as well as potentially qualifying for what you heard um, James mention, a pediatric voucher that can be further monetized. 
Just to give you an example, um, in February of this year, Biomarin sold their pediatric voucher to an undisclosed buyer for, for uh, 110 million US dollars. Um, I briefly touched on the Johns Hopkins and Kazia collaboration in ATRT. They continue to work toward the goal, that final objective of this collaboration to creating enough data to justify a clinical trial in ATRT. We're thrilled to announce last Friday that the FDA did grant Paxalicib with orphan drug designation for the treatment of ATRT. The final column I call is, uh, is more of a, it's more of a catch-all for now. You know, I believe that in the near term and as data comes to light, we may build out additional columns dedicated to specific other pediatric CNS-related tumors, such as you heard medulloblastoma, high-grade glioma, or even low-grade glioma, just to name a few. Um, at this point, I'll turn it back to um, Dr. Garner uh, for, for any closing remarks, and then we can jump into some Q&A. Thank you, John. And uh, I, I hope the last uh, 25, 30 minutes has really given a sense of the breadth of the work that's going on here, but also the depth. I think some, some uh, extraordinary science that has been applied to, to this most challenging form of brain tumor. And uh, welcome the opportunity to discuss this further now and some, uh, some, some Q&A. So I'm going to uh, hand back to Sue and the Edison team to uh, steer us through, uh, through some questions. Great, let's kick this off here. We have a, we have a full house. Uh, we have quite a few questions. Uh, let's, uh, maybe the first one goes to James. Pharmaceutical companies have traditionally been reluctant to develop drugs for pediatric cancers for various different reasons. Could you walk us through some of those challenges and perhaps how they may have started to change? Yes, I, I think that's fair comment. I think this hasn't uh, historically been seen as an area of focus for, for, for most companies. I think partly there's been a perception of relatively small numbers of patients, and partly there's been a perception that uh, developing drugs for children, not just for, for children with cancer, but for children generally, is difficult and challenging and, and risky. The side effect profile can be different. The behavior of the drug can be very different. Um, and running clinical trials can be very different in a pediatric population. I think both of those concerns are rapidly disappearing. I think we've seen, uh, as, as certainly in the field of cancer, as we've seen a, you know, really the focus move increasingly to, to very, very precise, often genetically defined subsets of particular tumors, um, they've started to approximate in size some of these pediatric malignancies. And uh, so, for example, we don't really develop drugs for lung cancer anymore, which is the most common cancer. We develop drugs for ALK positive lung cancer. We develop drugs for third line EGFR positive uh, lung cancer. And those patient populations are smaller. And I think proportionally that's, that's worked in the favor of, of childhood cancers. Um, so I, I think uh, for those reasons and some of the regulatory considerations that we touched on earlier, I think this is a, a growing area. And I think companies like uh, Genzyme, like Day One Biopharmaceuticals and, and, and uh, some private companies like Onco Heroes have really demonstrated this. There's a very valid commercial business case here as, as well as a huge unmet medical need. Okay, great. Matt, how about uh, a couple here combined? Um... It seems like it, uh, it's challenging to seek therapies for childhood brain cancer. What's motivated you to focus on this disease area? And then maybe you can kind of highlight some key impediments and uh, other things that you think uh, would help improve the outcomes of diseases such as DIPG. Um, thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, so I've been a pediatric uh, ca cancer researcher for uh, 11 years now um, and about seven years into my postdoctoral studies uh, my daughter was diagnosed with diffuse, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma um, and of course uh, in Australia we're fortunate to be supported by uh, revolutionary clinical trial programs that use biopsy material to try and get a get on top of what kind of mutations and changes are causing the tumor and when we found uh, when we did this in my daughter Josie's tumor, we found that she had multiple disruptions to the PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, which then caused me to search the world for a brain penetrant PI3 kinase inhibitor. And I came across um, Paxalicid, then GDC0084, um, and, and contacted James about testing it preclinically in my lab. 
Um, and of course, Casio were, were very accommodating. Um, they, they came up to my lab, they visited our facilities. We, we met many times and we started our Paxalicid research program. And of course, we, we, we used it uh, directly in comparison to glioblastoma cells for which it was in uh, early stage uh, clinical trials. Uh, and we found that our DAPG cell lines, regardless of whether they harbored PI3 kinase mutations, were sensitive to the drug and, and almost twofold more sensitive than GBM cells. So it really encouraged us to continue to work with the drug and to really work up how we use it appropriately, dosing, timing, uh, um, and, and what we combine it with, which is the most important thing. When you have such a heterogeneous and, and aggressive cancer like DIBG and, and high-grade glioma, uh, single monotherapies, regardless of what they are, are not going to resolve the tumor. So a biological understanding of what uh, contributes to the growth of these tumors, what kind of metabolic programs are being instructed by the changes in the genome, and, and then what potential uh, therapeutic vulnerabilities may be unlocked by the use of the therapies is, is really what my group tries to do. And, and we're really pushing forward with uh, understanding how these drugs work within the tumor cells, and then what we can exploit to, to make them work even better. I mean, of course, there's many challenges with treating um, children with brain cancer. You know, the blood-brain barrier is a huge uh, obstacle to any kind of positive benefit from a systemic um, therapy. Um, but one of the things about Paxalis is, is its brain penetration and its potential to cross the CNS and show activity within the brain. And it's relatively safe um, uh, toxicity profile. You know, there are um, PI3 kinase related side effects, which we're, we're starting to manage. And in some cases, I think some of those side effects are indicative of how well the drug is working. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I, I think that um, the, the drug plays a role not only in the, uh, uh, the inhibiting the growth of the tumour, but may also encourage some of the body's own defence systems to upregulate and help the drug to, to, to have an effect. Um, uh, and was there anything else in the question? Sorry, there was a few things there, Sue. Yeah, that, that's, very, that's awesome. Um, maybe one for John here. Uh, the PNOC22 study is essentially an investor-initiated study, and Kazi has a number of partnerships in place. Could you elaborate on this approach? That's a great question. The, um, the, the PNOC22 is an investigator-initiated trial. I think we could call it more of a cooperative group trial, uh, which, is a, which is a great collaboration from our standpoint, because we are talking about a, a rare pediatric tumor. You know, most of these uh, patients are seen within, you know, a couple handful of academic centers across, you know, the U.S., but also North America, Australia, and even Europe. So really, you need those, those um, academic centers with that, that level of expertise to really recruit and enroll, um, you know, both DIPG or DMG, but also potentially even some of the other um, tumor types, such as ATRT. Um, it makes sense from a from a, um, a cost perspective, because these cooperative group studies really um, offer up some synergies and, and also in terms of getting studies up and running because time is money, especially when it comes to research. So they can get studies up and running much, much faster than an industry sponsored trial. Um, and they execute because they're behind the program 100%. They're not getting involved. They're not um, agreeing to participate in the study unless they believe in what they're doing. They believe in the study. They believe in the, the arms within the study um, and the potential benefit for their patients. Okay, maybe a follow-up to that question. Um, is it possible for PNO CO 2020 study to provide a basis for registration in DIPG or do you anticipate additional studies will be required? I think we all would love to see it as a registration study. I think that's really a um, discussion that needs to happen with the, with the regulatory bodies. So when you look at a rare um, pediatric um, indication such as DMG or DIPG, um, you look at you know what is out there. Are there any approved therapies currently? Is this truly an unmet need? Um, is it a highly aggressive tumor where even with non-approved agents, are these patients still progressing very, very quickly? So I think the answer, as you heard um, uh, Professor Dunn and James mentioned earlier, the answers are clearly a yes. And then it's a matter of, well, um, you know, how many patients are being enrolled? How many patients are being able to demonstrate both um, the benefit and the risk to this patient population? 
And actually the study is very well designed. It's a very unique design, one of kind of more of a, a, an adaptive design that the FDA has bought off on multiple other approvals over the last decade or so. Um, and so, I, and, and we mentioned total numbers. Um, we're, we're, this is the largest, as far as I know, Matt, but correct me if I'm wrong, but this is by far the largest undertaking in diffuse midline glioma of any trial ever executed. So we're talking several several hundred DMG patients is is the ultimate goal. Could be could be a little less and it could be a little bit more. Okay. Uh, James, how about this question for you? Uh, this data and the design of the PNOC 2020 study links Casia in some respects to Chimerics, a company developing ONC 201. Is this a collaboration or a loose strategic alignment of sorts? We, we certainly don't have any formal relationship with Chimerics, but, uh, but at the same time, we, we absolutely have some shared interests. And I think uh, there's, a lot of, uh, so there's a lot of cultural similarity between the companies. We're, we're in regular contact with them. We're huge admirers of the work they've done with, with ONC 201. And uh, so I think uh, as the, the PNOP 22 study progresses, as we see more of this data that increasingly identifies these two drugs on 201 and Paxalacid as, as a potential new standard of care in this disease. Obviously, those are, those are discussions that are, that are going to get uh, deeper and, and more frequent. So uh, I think we're, uh, we're, we're in contact and we're, we're looking forward to, to seeing where those discussions go. Great. How about Matt? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of PI3K inhibitor in childhood brain cancer, such as DIPG? What makes the class of medicines interesting to a researcher? Thanks, Sue. Um, so it, it appears that, that all these tumors rely on, on some kind of glucose homeo homeostasis uh, for their proliferation and, and their metabolomic needs. Uh, and so blocking um, the uh, adapter protein that, that links to all of these uh, cell surface receptors um, directly downstream of them is, is an attractive therapeutic option. So. As you can imagine, um, these cells are very highly complex. Uh, targeting pathways right down the bottom of, uh, um, of dysregulation leads to uh, rapid forms of resistance. So if you can block uh, the signaling pathways right at the top where, where, where the, um, the ligand or the substrates are, are acquired, uh, means that you get a suppression of the signaling pathways downstream. Um, of course, uh, there's, there's always a consequence with targeting such an important protein and an important pathway. Um, but it appears that these uh, tumours rely more specifically on, on glu direct glucose uptake um, uh, than normal cells, for example. Uh, and as a consequence, you get you get um, a, a lower uh, cell amount of drug required to kill the, the tumour cells compared to normal neurons or or ne normal uh, um, hematological cells uh, so, uh, such as um, um, bone marrow stem cells, for example. So so it's an attractive uh, approach in terms of, of um, spe specificity for the for the cancer cells. Um, but also, again, um, you know, what we're kind of doing here is we are shepherding the cells to grow in a particular way by blocking one of the pathways that it needs for survival. And the work that we're really doing is to figure out, OK, well, now that we've blocked that pathway, what's being turned on in compensation? Because these are, you know, aggressive tumor cells. They are pre-programmed to survive. They're, you know, meant to be immortal. So they are always going to upregulate other pathways to, to drive their growth and survival. And so now all of the work that we've done uh, is identifying what pathways they are and whether we can then combine with other therapies. It's a challenge in kids, of course, because one, as James and John have beautifully articulated, it's a rare disease indication. So getting enough readout about uh, toxicities and benefits and, and failures is difficult and slow. Um, I suppose the nice thing about PNOC 022 uh, is that it's opening at so many centres and, and all of the groups that are there are invested in, in the program. We are getting uh, efficacy readouts in real time. Uh, we are getting toxicity readouts if they are any in real time. Uh, and for example, the, the you know the, the the weak adverse events in terms of the mucositis is now almost completely been ameliorated with dexamethasone mouthwash. You know that kind of information is feeding across all of the centres in real time, and, and we meet uh, multiple times a month to discuss clinical outcomes and also preclinical uh, discoveries, so that we can design the trial to add additional therapies. You know, are there therapies that can stop side effects? Are there therapies that can make the drugs work better? Are there dietary interventions that might be able to make the drugs work better? Um, and so, of course, it's a challenge, but, but by putting together such a, a large consortium of uh, researchers and also, of course, uh, of uh, dedicated farmers or biotech companies means that we're all working together to try and move the needle in the right direction as quickly as we can. 
That's wonderful. Uh, John, how about this one for you? Um, are there lessons from Kasia's work in adult brain cancer that can be translated into this research here? I think it's a similar, right? So as you as you know, or, or maybe some of the folks that are on the call, you know, yeah. as James had mentioned, we are in a kind of a comparable sort of cooperative group adaptive trial platform design trial with another cooperative group called GCAR in glioblastoma. And so we've definitely had some lessons learned from that in terms of execution, but also ensuring sort of our own um, oversight and, and management of the trial. And really it goes along the same line that Matt was mentioning, you know, it's the sites, the sites make it this, the proper sites that are really um, seeing these particular patients and, and these rare diseases and they buy into the study, they buy into the study design as well as the efficacy that they may be hearing from other collaborators, both in other studies, but also in potentially expanded access or compassionate use. Um, they're, they're buying off onto it and, and seeing those sorts of patients and enrolling those patients. So we've definitely seen that partnering is really key. And uh, we've been very successful both on, on both ends, the adult trials, but also in, in our pediatric program. Okay, James, um, the positive data from day one biopharmaceuticals tovarofeneb program in low-grade glioma has, has been a notable catalyst for their share price. Does this have any implications for Pixilib and uh, do you view them as your competition? Well, it, it's, a, it's a different drug and a different disease and, and you know, very, very different environment altogether. So I don't think there's any direct sense in, in which Paxalacib and uh, Day 101 are, are uh, you know, in any, any meaningful competition here. I think we, we, we certainly take a lot of encouragement from what they've done, however. You know, their focus has been on pediatric brain cancer, in their case, um, pediatric low-grade glioma, a sort of almost the counterpart to the sort of diseases that uh, Professor Dunn was speaking about. And, um, and uh, you, you know, I think it's shown that the investment community can embrace companies that are focused on what would traditionally be seen as, as rare or less common cancers. Day, day one is a billion dollar company today. And, uh, you know, they're, um, they're, they're really focused very, very specifically on this area. So I think it shows that there is, there is a viable business and there is a, a, an argument from corporate strategy to focus on uh, on these kind of diseases, as well as, of course, an, an argument for from from medical need. Maybe we can squeeze two more in here, uh, John. Uh, commercially, what do you view as the prospects for DIPG therapy with such small populations? Do you anticipate this to be a profitable business? I'll jump in. I'm not sure we want the medical guy talking about commercial, but I'll, I'll jump in, <laughs> give you my opinion, and then James is the CEO. He may be able to put on his uh, commercial hat and and expand. Um, I think James had mentioned that there are a lot of companies out there looking at much more rare diseases than, than DIPG, DMG, and even ATRT for that matter, and have commercially been very, very successful. It's more from my standpoint, what's, what's the medical need and, and where is the medical need and where Hexalcept truly can add value. And whether that's from the standpoint of a label indication or in terms of a peer reviewed journal publication such that you know um, researchers and, and physicians can utilize hexalicib and other potential indications as long as it's been shown and 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 published that it's you know safe and effective um, i don't know james if you wanted to talk we didn't really talk too much about epidemiology but as I mentioned, there are a lot of more rare diseases out there and companies that have done quite well. John, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, in some ways, the, in my view, the, the question about the commercial viability of these rare, predominantly pediatric indications was asked and answered by, by Genzyme. You know, that company focused primarily on metabolic diseases, but diseases that particularly affected, affected childhood lysosomal storage diseases, things of that sort. Um, some of those illnesses have 30 or 40 incident cases worldwide per annum. You know, they are exceptionally rare. 
and that company was bought by Sanofi for twenty billion dollars. So, um, so I think it, it, you know, it certainly gives a sense that there, there is a there is a value here. And although these are smaller patient populations, they they're they're very very focused in generally academic centres and very science led in terms of the behaviour of physicians. So, it's just a very different business model for companies, but but absolutely a viable one. Matt, maybe one here, last one here for you. Um, as someone who's been working in this space for a long time, how excited are you by the progress you've made so far? And are, are we at a pivotal point here? Um, when you when you uh, uh, are so closely linked to the disease uh, and when you speak yeah. to families uh, every day, um, one must always show ca a cautious optimism. Um, this is a horrendous, a devastating disease. Uh, it, it needs treatment. Um, I always remain optimistic. Uh, if I didn't have um, uh, any optimism uh, for the, in the work that we were doing, uh, to be honest, uh, I would pr probably have left the field and I'd probably be having weekends and enjoying life with my family. Um, but to be honest, uh, we, we, I do see some potential in the work that we're doing uh, and, and I do hold on hope that the patients will benefit from it. Um, we've seen a couple of cases where some families have experienced the benefit. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, unfortunately for, for some of those families, it's only been temporary. So there's still a lot of work to do. We really need to understand why some patients respond and why some don't. Um, and what makes them become resistant quickly. So there is a lot of work to do, but again, uh, in, an, in an indication where there's absolutely no recognised therapy, we, we need to first move that needle in the right direction. And then like the case of, you know, for example, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, where patients will receive up to three or four different cytotoxic and, and metabolites uh, during their course of therapies, we, we, we need to start to move that needle in the right direction for kids with DIPG and DMG. And if Paxalicid and Octo are another starting point, great. Do I think that's the end point? Absolutely not. Uh, that's really just the beginning. That's the beginning of how we figure out what kind of drugs and what kind of regimens we design for these children. And then hopefully together um, uh, we start to do, you know, we start to see that the, the two, five, 10 year survivals start to come out. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for all your work. Um, I, I, I think this is really all we have time for today. I mean, we have a lot more questions, but um, maybe you can kind of direct those to us uh, at the, the contact that we have on the Kazia press release. Um, thank you for joining in this call and really have a great day. Thank you, everyone.